Hello, I'm Simon from Trifork. And I'm Ole from Trifork. And we're here interviewing Trisha G from Ilmax. And Trisha, can you tell a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm Trisha G from Ilmax. I'm a developer there. Uh, I'm also, um, a, a, I guess, a leader in the London Java Youth Group as well. So I sort of have two main roles when I come to these conferences. And uh, a bit about your development background. Uh, I've been developing for over 10 years, um, started off working at a Ford Motor Company many years ago and since then worked in a bunch of different industries. Um, I've been working in finance, financial markets for the last five, six years, something like that, um, and been at LMAX for the last three years. Mm -hmm. And what's your language of choice? Java. Java. Okay. Pretty much exclusively yeah. Java. Okay. Um, and what, what are you working on uh, right now? What project? Um, at the moment, we have four different teams in uh, LMAX uh, at the moment. Uh, we've got two working on sort of features and new functionality and, and sort of traditional development type stuff. We've got a team who's working on, uh, it's more of a sort of DevOps type, type team and doing handling some of the production support stuff. And then we've got another team that's working on performance and stability and capacity management. And this, as we get more users, we're trying to expand and, and continue to to retain our good speed and our good quality of execution and so I'm now working on performance and stability and, and capacity management at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I know in, uh, in LMAX uh, you're doing uh, a low latency high, high throughput trading platform. So I, I read about that uh, and you've used the Disruptor framework. Yes. Can you explain a little bit about this uh, framework? So we created the Disruptor because we um, we did the good scientific thing and measured our system and we were trying to get the latency down as low as possible. And um, we created the disruptor when we found that the queues in between the different stages in our pipeline was the highest latency part mm -hmm. of the system. Not the bit, not the interesting bit that's doing the business logic, but just queuing things from system to system. And so the disruptor is, is just a very, very quick way of doing that. Um, but rather than just being a much faster queue, which is where we originally started, we realised that what we could do is have a single data structure which would be a central place for all the different bits of the pipeline to get what they wanted from it. So rather than having to send it here and then here and then here, mm -hmm. we have it in this sort of central ring buffer, ring buffer and then we wire up the dependencies of the different parts of the pipeline to fetch it when we need it. Mm -hmm. So you get much faster execution, you get really nice um, batching behaviour from the fact that it's a ring buffer um, and you get this really nice way to manage your dependencies and, and, and sort of see the way that the work flows through your system. And what about uh, there's no need for synchronization and this right. buffer? Or? It's kind of it's completely lock free, okay. uh, and that's yeah. what gives it that's what gives it the speed. Um, everything's managed by sequence numbers. So this ring buffer has a sequence number to say where it's written to, the most recent thing it's written to. Each of the things which reads from it has a sequence number to say where it's got up to as well. And it's these sort of magic sequence numbers which coordinate everything. So if I've got something down here at the end of the pipeline which needs to make sure that all of these have finished doing what they're doing. All it has to do is read the sequence numbers of those things, rather than get notified or rather than mm -hmm. wait on any yes. locks. And, and the sequence numbers can be volatile, so then that way anything that happens before you update your sequence number has definitely happened. So when, you're, when your sequence number updates, then you've got, you've got all the writes that happened in the ring buffer. We don't have to lock anything at all, it's all just done with sort of volatiles, memory barriers and, and these magic sequence numbers. And you said you are involved in this uh, Java developer community. Yes. And uh, since it's Java, it's a bit old, and some say it's legacy, and, and so uh, what do you do to keep this uh, community alive and uh, vibrant? Actually, that's, a, that's an excellent question, because we, we as the London Java community, we're a little bit... Um, we like to complain a lot, that's kind of part of one of those things that we do. And we sort of made it felt amongst the more global community that we had um, sort of concerns around Java and the Java community and, and where it was going. And, um, and basically someone said to us, well, why don't you do something about it? Mm -hmm. So we got ourselves uh, elected to the executive committee of the Java community process. Mm -hmm. So now we have a seat on the, uh, on the executive committee. So rather than just standing in the background going, oh, Java's rubbish and it's dying, it's not doing what we developers need, it's not doing what our industry needs, we have a, a seat on the, on the committee sort of saying, well, actually, this looks like it's going to be good for Java, it's going to be good for the community, it's going to be good for developers, or 
this doesn't really, it's a great idea, but it doesn't really, when you use it as a real developer, the, the API doesn't make any sense and it's going to be difficult and you haven't got buy-in from vendors, so go away and think about it some more and then come back to us a bit later. So one of the ways we try and not just keep Java alive as a, as a community, but we're really trying to feed it back in sort of via Oracle and via Java and just really try and um, make sure that the next versions do what we want it to do rather than just complain when the next version comes out and go, oh no, it doesn't support mm -hmm. lambdas the way I want it to or whatever. Don't you get a little envious of all the other JVM languages, for example? Not really. You prove it, you, can, you have lambdas and uh, Clojure is functional programming. And yeah, I mean, that, that way. that's, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask because I'm a bit like, when, when new technologies come along, I think, oh, that's nice, but. I'm kind of doing this thing at the moment, and I don't really have any space in my head for this new thing. So I, I don't tend to be one of these technology bandwagon people because I just I like to learn something and learn it well, and, and I just don't have time to keep jumping on the new bandwagon. I do look at things like, um, I was doing some stuff in uh, C Sharp of all things, and the way that the delegates worked, I was like, oh, that's quite nice. Mm -hmm. Should we have that in Java? Yes. So yeah, there's a certain amount of that. But when you feel a sort of pang of jealousy or a kind of, oh, we're missing that, then you try and push for that in either through, well, you can't really push for it for the JCP because you have to submit JSRs and there's a formal process to go through. But we, one of the other things we're trying to do is get more involved in the Open JDK. So there we can start making very small incremental actual changes to Java. Mm -hmm. And then as we get more people doing that and that we, get, we gain more trust within the Open JDK community, then we can start really doing what we want to do and opening things up to the world. So yeah, I mean, there's a certain amount of jealousy, but if a tool does what you want it to do, then use that tool. And if we can use, I don't know, Scala for some of the stuff where that's the right thing to use, then we use that, because they're all JVM languages, right? Okay, so that's it's what you mean by uh, using Java. It's the platform, not necessarily... Well, no, I use Java, just Java, just Java okay. the language. Okay. But there's no reason why you couldn't if you wanted to use some of the other JVM okay. languages. Mm. But yeah, I mean, if, if, if I felt extreme jealousy around one of those things, I'd go and work somewhere where you could definitely do that, or yeah. find a way that it was going to work within the business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I heard you were involved in the graduate development community too, and what's your involvement in this uh, community? I, I feel really, really passionate about making sure that people don't make the same mistakes again and again. And I think that um, for the sort of first five years of my career, I kind of floundered a little bit trying to figure out where I was going, what I was doing, and I don't really, I don't have older brothers and sisters, I don't have older cousins, I don't have parents who work in the industry. I've got no, in my mind, I've got no mentors to follow and, and sort of tell me, oh, well, that's just sort of how it is in the industry, but you can get around it by this, this, and this. And by this, I sort of mean more of the, some of the more political things than the actual technology mm -hmm. things. Understanding that as a developer, you're, um, you, you're kind of head down in, in the code and, and you always sat at a computer and in order to get promoted, you need to do stuff that isn't code. And some of that political stuff. And I kind of want to feed a lot of that hard-earned knowledge back into the graduate community. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, so kind of letting other people learn from some of my mistakes. Another thing is that um, I feel, I guess kind of related, I feel people don't come into our industry who, I think we're missing people, I think there are yes. people who, yes. who drop out either at a very early age or even at university and they go and do their degree and they, they think, so they think I don't know, I like computers but I don't like coding or um, I like coding but I don't really want to work at a computer all day or I don't like the fact that I'm going to be a lone shark or mm -hmm. so there's something like that and I, I really think that just by showcasing the industry, the all of it, lots of things that we do, things like um, some of the agile stuff, some of the pair programming, some of the idea of developer and test, which is a different sort of idea than just developer, the collaboration, technical authors, business analysts, and showcasing this massive diversity of roles that we have to, to the development developer, the graduate developer community. I think that people are going to go, wow, I didn't know there was such a thing as technical author. I wonder what that does. That sounds like it's going to scratch my itch to understand things, but it also allows me to communicate, and I like the idea of writing. And I just think that people are dropping out because, they're, because they don't know, and we're not telling them what we do. So one of the programs we've come up with is a, is a meet a mentor program. It's like speed dating with mentors. <laughs> and uh, so we're just getting mentors of, we're just getting it started in London at the moment. We've only had a few events, but it's, it's, it's turning out really well. We have sort of tables of, of graduates with two mentors, so pair mentoring, it's all good XP practices, mm -hmm. and two mentors, and, and they sh share their stories of how they got to where they are. And the mentors might be 
might have 10, 15, 20 years experience, or they might be a couple of years out of college, and, and that's fine. That kind of range of, of experience is really good. So you can the graduates can see, oh, it's quite difficult in the first couple of years because of this, and the difference between university and and you know your first couple of years in, in industry is this. You can get that from a new-ish graduate mentor versus, oh, all right, in 10, 15 years' time, I could be there, I could be doing mm -hmm. that. And it's nice to get that that difference of opinion. And, and the, men, the, the graduates who've done it so far have really enjoyed it. They've sort of said, I didn't know. I want to know more about business analysis, or I want to know more about um, all the different technologies we're using, or I, I, I want to know about this pair programming thing. Because you don't do pair pro programming at university, right? You're told to do that project and get it done. Yeah. So it gives them ideas on questions to ask. It doesn't answer all their questions. It actually opens them up to more questions they can ask, and people they can ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine when you have these uh, mentors in pair, then they can, then they mentor each other also. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you can learn a lot. Mm -hmm. One of the things I get, I get asked a lot. You know, um, I don't think I've really got much to offer because um, I'm doing my PhD at the moment, or I've just, I've just graduated, and I've only done a year in industry, or um, I've done five years, but I'm not an architect or anything. I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And and they've got so much to offer the graduates, but they've got a lot to offer anyone who's been around for longer than that as well, because you know it's it's ten years since I graduated, and I I graduated in the dot com crash, and things were quite different then than they are now. Well, I think they are. They might be. I'm not sure. That's the thing, right? So I learn a lot from those guys as to what it takes to to make that step from university to industry, and and, and they kind of learn a lot about how you know I found my career path, or, or you know the fact that you can. I don't know, when I graduated, you can be a developer for 10 years. I thought you have to be a developer and then a team lead and mm, then a project yeah, manager yeah. because that's what you, you see. And seeing that someone can just do the same thing, not the same thing, but have the same job title for 10 years, mm. but learn so much and come so far is, is quite nice as well. Okay. Last question. What is your biggest uh, aversion in IT today? So, something you don't Would like. Would really hate. Yeah, like Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> oh, I've got to think of just one. Um, <laughs> what do I really hate? Um, I really dislike um, sort of incorrect stereotyping of stuff. And this, this is quite broad, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I really dislike is the, the way the media portrays our industry. That really irritates me. But even inside our own industry, we've got this kind of like, Oh, C sharp developers are, and Java developers are, mm. and in this kind of we have this sort of siloing by things. You know, you're a you're a Java financial markets developer, and I'm a Python Web 2.0 developer, and I'm like, well, yeah, but we're in technology, you know, mm. and it has certain expectations over how you dress and how you walk and what you eat and you know the beer you drink, and it's just like, oh. I mean, this isn't just IT, right? This is across the industry, across the whole of society, but I really hate this kind of, oh, it's us and them sort of thing. At the moment, when, a few weeks back, I was working in DevOps, and that team has some developers and some operation systems guys, and we work together as one team, which is kind of a nice DevOps thing. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you move into DevOps, within the day, you start talking about them, meaning the developers, yeah. <laughs> and you're a developer, yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's this whole us and them mentality, and I just think that a bit more collaboration, a bit more, we're all people, we're all in together, we all want to, we're all on the same team. Like, yeah. in, if you want to think of it as IT people generally being sort of on the same team versus the rest of the world, then that's a little bit more useful. But this kind of, these kind of barriers and clans and us mm. and them, it's just a bit, it doesn't get anyone anywhere, I don't think. Okay. Well, thanks for the interview. No problem, thanks very much. Mm.